Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. The biggest tech story in recent years has been the rise of artificial intelligence. The subject is everywhere. It's been AI this and AI that. The Wikipedia article on ChatGPT, the company that really got things rolling in this area, was the most popular Wikipedia article in all of 2023. 50 million visits. That made it more popular than even Christian Ronaldo, the world's most famous athlete. That's more than Barbie and Oppenheimer put together. And this tech is being adopted everywhere, mostly for good. I mean, just look at the medical field. AI is being used to sort through chains of molecules to come up with the next generation of breakthrough drugs, including those that will work on antibiotic-resistant bacteria and the misfolded proteins behind Alzheimer's. AI is being trained to quickly find things in scans and x-rays that a human technician might miss. AI can be used to make better decisions in real time. For example, it can learn traffic and pedestrian patterns and synchronize lights for more efficient movement of everyone. AI should even have an impact on fighting climate change by creating better models. And when it comes to world hunger, AI can analyze zillions of data points to help determine what crops, seeds, fertilizers, soil, and so on are required for maximum efficiency in any area of the world. AI is growing at an exponential rate. It's predicted that the industry will grow by 250% over the next five years. By 2031, the market for a generative AI will be at least 1 trillion US dollars. And yes, AI can also be used for evil. Deep fakes and fake news, copyright infringement and forgery, cybersecurity breaches, manipulation of financial markets. AI is inevitably going to replace humans in a lot of different jobs, too, so there is a lot to be concerned about. And if you're listening to me, you're probably wondering about artificial intelligence in music, which is good, because there is going to be an impact. Best we know where this intersection of music and tech came from so that we can maybe figure out where it's going. This is the history and future of AI in music. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Kraftwerk, one of the most technically minded groups of all time. That's Computer World from 1981, a time when artificial intelligence was nothing but science fiction. Flash forward to today, and it's not science fiction anymore. It's reality. Hello again, I'm Ellen Cross, and I wonder what Kraftwerk makes of all this AI stuff. The group still exists and might be experimenting with things in whatever sonic lab they have operating these days. And there is no question that AI is going to have some kind of effect on music. But what? Hang on. We need to start with a little history so we can put everything into perspective. People have been trying to get machines to make music for hundreds of years. Back in the year 1206, there was an inventor in Upper Mesopotamia in modern-day Iraq named Ismail el Jazari. He created a music machine that featured four humanoid robots that could play music. They were programmed by an intricate system of rotating wooden pegs powered by hydraulics. It's pretty cool stuff, but completely mechanical. There was no machine learning involved. Same thing with music boxes. They were first invented in Switzerland somewhere around 1770. Metal prongs are plucked by a rotating metal cylinder featuring carefully placed bumps. As the cylinder turns, the prongs were flicked by the bumps and played a tune. Again totally mechanical, not intelligent. We have to fast forward to 1948 and the birth of the computer age before we encounter anything that resembles what we have today. And even then, this was super, super primitive. Alan Turing, the great British computer pioneer, programmed his Mark II machine, which was a monster that took up the entire ground floor of his computing machine laboratory in Manchester. And he began coaxing music out of the Mark II in the late 1940s. In 1951, the BBC showed up with a remote recording unit with the task of capturing three songs performed by Turing's computer. And here is the result, the first known recording of computer music. This is all that survives from that session.
<laughs> Other experiments with music and computers were being conducted around the world. In late 1950, a machine in Australia started to produce music, with the help of a lot of programmers, of course. Dr. Trevor Piercy and his team at the University of Sydney had a giant, a seven metric ton unit called CYRAC that they used for weather forecasting and banking transactions. It had a whopping two kilobytes of memory and just kilobytes of storage working at a speed of 0.001 megahertz. Not a speed demon. But the CYRAC machine also had a speaker that blurted out sounds to indicate where it was in the running of a program. Just boings and burps, really. But then sometime in early 1951, a programmer named Jeff Hill figured out how to make the CYRAC emit a steady tone from that speaker. Once he figured out how to get the machine to play one tone, he worked on having it play others. And after a while, he could put together all these generatable tones in the order of a tune. He started messing about and got CYRAC to play the melodies of popular tunes of the day. A lot of them were drinking songs, by the way. This is Australia. Unfortunately, none of this music was ever recorded, but it has been reconstructed using its original punch paper programming tapes, which have miraculously survived. What you're about to hear is some of the first use of a computer to create music. The next big development came in 1957 at Bell Labs in the United States. It had an IBM 704 mainframe. A researcher of acoustics named Max Matthews got some time on the machine and started the world on the road to the creation, making, listening to, and distribution of computer-generated music. He hooked up his violin and got the 704 to capture some of its tones. That led to the development of a synthesis program he called, what else? Music! And the result was a 17-second tune. Okay, so not exactly a work of art, but it was certainly an amazing achievement for 1957. And more was to come. In 1961, Matthews and four other engineers got an IBM 7904 mainframe not to just play a song, but to sing using synthesized human speech. Again, awfully cool for 1961. It just so happens that sci-fi author Arthur C. Clarke was visiting the day of that demonstration. He was so impressed that he and Stanley Kubrick incorporated it into 2001 A Space Odyssey. Remember when astronaut David Bowman decommissioned the homicidal HAL 9000 computer? My instructor was Mr. Langley, and he taught me to sing a song. If you'd like to hear it, I can sing it for you. Yes, I'd like to hear it, Hal. Sing it for me. It's called Daisy. 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 Give me your answer, to. I'm The HAL 9000 of 2001 A Space Odyssey was a 1968 impression of what artificial intelligence would become one day. In 1967, a kid named Ray Kurzweil, who was all of 17, appeared on the CBS show I've Got a Secret with host Steve Allen. He demonstrated a piece of music for the piano that was composed by a computer that he built and programmed. Is it writing music at this moment? Uh, right now it's writing a tune. Writing a tune. 
I have a feeling that uh, as a non-scientist, I'm not going to understand this uh, too well, but uh, perhaps you can explain how it works. First of all, I want the folks to see sort of some of this. This nest of spaghetti-like wire here is united to a bunch of little watts. What are these uh, black things over here, Raymond? Well, those are relays. That's what does it. That's the right of music. I see. The relays write the music. They feed it into this uh, white cheese box here, whatever that is. And there are three little... Are these wires or just pieces of string? Uh, pieces of string or wires. I mean, does a message go through there? Or they just pull uh, the no, that's just uh, recording what the music, what the computer says. I see. And then the uh, typewriter does the final part of the process. The song generated by the computer sounded like this when played by a human. By the way, that Ray Kurzweil is the same guy who inspired Our Lady Peace in so many different ways, including many of their songs. Their 2000 album, Spiritual Machines, came about after the band read through some of Kurzweil's books on technology. So, this seems to be the right time to play something from that record. Our Lady Peace, big fans of inventor and thinker Ray Kurzweil, someone who was involved in something approaching the nexus of music and artificial intelligence as early as the mid-1960s. Now, we haven't actually touched on anything involving artificial intelligence yet. Everything that we've heard so far involved computers producing music after being given instructions by humans. By today's standards, these were all relatively amusing party tricks. but. Just wait. Through the 1970s and 80s, computing power grew exponentially. Faster processing, more memory, better storage. This tech was incorporated into machines that made music. Synthesizers, samplers, digital recording software, and the computer that could run it. Humans programmed the gear, and the machines did what they were told. Mostly. Meanwhile, computer scientists continued to push the envelope of what a computer could do on its own. In the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of effort put into creating a computer that could beat a human in chess. You might remember stories about an IBM machine called Deep Blue taking on champion Garry Kasparov. In 1997, there was a competition at the University of Oregon. Three pieces were performed in front of an audience of music experts. One was by a computer called EMI, which was given information on the musical style of classical composer J.S. Bach. The goal of the competition was to fool the audience. Could they tell which of the three pieces was written by a computer? Okay, so they were actually able to pick out the computer piece. But they also believed that the computer had played an actual Bach composition. David Cope, the man behind this computer called EMI, or actually it's Emmy, had figured out a way for Emmy to scan compositions by famous composers, draw out the styles from the data points, and then crank out a new piece that was a reasonable facsimile of the real thing. Emmy would later go on to release an album entitled Classical Music Composed by Computer, Experiments in Musical Intelligence. Amy turned out to be a pretty good student of Bach, Chopin, Stravinsky, and even some Scott Joplin jazz. If you know anything about ragtime that came out of the beginning of the 20th century, that's pretty spot on. And it was written by a computer after learning from music written by humans. It is still mimicry and imitation, but it's a huge leap from the bleeps and boops that came out of older machines. These early experiments freaked out a lot of people. Music was supposed to come from the heart, from a place of intense emotion, colored by personal experiences. Could such a personal and human form of expression be duplicated by a machine? Around 2000 is when we get into some serious deep learning with computers. This resulted in a new series of algorithms that got better and better at composing music. We begin to hear about AI-generated music. But what is that exactly? 
AI-generated music is material that is composed, generated, and created with the help of artificial intelligence technology like neural networks. These machines analyze existing music for patterns, chord changes, melody lines, rhythm, tempo, and so on, and then applies those patterns into writing something new. Again, the machines and their algorithms aren't being creative. This is the application of pattern and style recognition. It is a collaboration between human and machine. And if the human puts in junk, the computer will respond with junk. It's like a recipe. If you have the right ingredients in the right proportions, the results will be tasty. If not, then you end up with something bland or totally inedible. In 1993, an MIT student named Jeffrey Limbs wrote a thesis. The topic was how computers could be programmed to reproduce musical rhythms that had more of a human feel and sounded less robotic. Some of the first successful AI-generated music was created by a program called IMUS by engineers at the University of Malaga in Spain. IMUS was pretty good at analyzing existing music and then offering up new music based on its analysis. IMUS composed Hello World, the first piece of music completely created and notated without any kind of human intervention. It was a classical composition for clarinet, violin, and piano. Now, this is not the computer playing. These are humans. But they're playing from sheet music created by Imus of the music that Imus conceived. Okay, not bad. Some avant-garde classical music played by humans, but written and notated by a computer. Work on artificial intelligence continued through the 2000s. And I can't recall anything that really made a lot of waves, but stuff was happening in the background. For example, in 2016, researchers in Paris announced Flow Machines, an AI system that was supposed to be a tool to help composers write something in a particular style. Flow Machines was built on software that analyzed 13,000 lead sheets. That meant basic scores that indicate melody and harmonies of songs in all sorts of genres from around the world. The software then wrote its own melodies, which were then taken by a human composer named Benoit Carré to produce a complete track. He made the choice to do something in the style of the Beatles, and he wrote the lyrics. At the end of the day, Flow Machines is credited with creating the first ever AI-generated pop song. It was something in the style of the Beatles called Daddy's Car. I want to play this for you because this is a milestone in AI and music. Daddy's Car, Melodies and Harmonies, generated by an artificial intelligence program called Flow Machines. Lyrics and final production by a meatbag named Benoit Carré. State-of-the-art stuff for 2016. Around the same time, there was Deep Jazz, a project that took shape at Princeton University. It was coded by Ji Sung Kim, a 20-year-old sophomore in the computer science faculty. He created it as part of a hacking competition using a Google photo generator called Deep Dream. That program worked by interpreting patterns in an image and then using what it learned to create other objects it already had in its database. Deep Jazz was a neural network that worked by assigning probabilities to notes. For example, if you play middle C and then up to D and E, there's a very high probability that the next note will be F. He also went back to Jeffrey Lyme's thesis on computer-generated rhythms. Jazz is all feel. It can't be robotic. Kim then posted the source code online with the note, this is an AI built to make jazz. And here is a sample of what deep jazz could do.
Okay, now we're getting somewhere. The concept of deep learning, the analysis of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of musical compositions really begins to take off. And the process works like this. First of all, humans amass a large data set of existing music made by other humans, all genres, all styles, all areas of the world. Next, the program analyzes all those songs, looking for patterns, structures, chord progressions, and other building block features. Once the analysis is complete, the AI is then trained to use the patterns and structures it is cataloged. The more powerful the program, the faster and more complete the training is. Once that's done, the AI uses what it has learned to generate new music. You could stop there, but listen, AI has no taste. Humans still need to tweak things, smoothing out sounds and sections that aren't aesthetically pleasing, adding instrumentation, removing instrumentation, messing with tempo and timbre and so on. And then you start again, a new data set, more analysis, and feeding any computer-generated music back into the data set so the program can learn from itself. At the same time these experiments were going on, Google introduced something called WaveNet, it specialized in generating natural-sounding speech. It was trained on tens of thousands of samples of people talking and then analyzed things 24,000 times a second to guess which sound should come next. Others got into the business of natural speech generation, or, as it's known, speech synthesis. The programs got better and better and better to the point where all that was needed was a few seconds of someone talking and the program could generate full phrases and conversations in that voice. Talking computers no longer sounded like the device that Stephen Hawking used. It became clear something was not quite right with me. I fell over and had great difficulty getting up again. My mother realized something was wrong and took me to the doctor. Instead, it sounded something like Hal in 2001. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Okay, so, so maybe not quite as homicidal and crazy. But this is the kind of research that gave us the voices that we now have with Alexa, Siri, Google Assistant and any of the other artificially generated voices that we interact with today. There was another Google program called InSynth. See what they did there? InSynth actually stands for Neural Synthesizer. It uses deep neural networks to create interesting sounds that are difficult or even impossible to produce elsewhere. You can try it for yourself. Google has a website where anyone can mess around with this program. One person who was really fascinated by all this was Grimes. She used in synth for a song on her 2020 album, Miss Anthropocene. It was called So Heavy I Fell Through the Earth. That's Grimes and So Heavy I Fell Through the Earth a song partially created using Google's InSynth Neural Network Music Program. AI, in other words. So far, so cool, right? But here's where things start to darken for musicians. Details coming up. While the world struggled through the pandemic, some people took the opportunity in lockdown to experiment with artificial intelligence programs, which were becoming more and more powerful every month. OpenAI was a nonprofit founded in San Francisco in 2015 with the goal of researching AI and creating safe and beneficial, that's their words, artificial intelligence. By 2019, they created some pretty interesting stuff, too interesting to remain a nonprofit. Investments started to pour in from Google, Microsoft, IBM, and Facebook. In 2019, it launched GPT-2, a program that could understand and answer questions in natural language. It was followed in 2020 by GPT-3, and that became OpenAI's first commercial product. To demonstrate things, OpenAI released this on SoundCloud, which they described as classic pop in the style of Frank Sinatra. The computer kind of got it right, but just listen to the lyrics. 
There is nothing wrong with your equipment. This is how the computer spit it out. Okay, so not great. But you could see where things were going. The following year, OpenAI released a variant program called DAL-E. It would eventually yield to ChatGPT in December 2022. That's the program that got all the attention and kicked off the current industrial and consumer interest in artificial intelligence. Okay, wait, hold on back up. There were other players messing around with this kind of technology to see if they could do better than OpenAI's fake Frank Sinatra. A text-to-speech program called Tacotron decided that they'd test things out in the world of music. In the summer of 2022, they generated a rap track that sounded exactly like Jay-Z and posted it on YouTube. It wasn't a conventional bit of hip-hop. Tacotron sampled Jay-Z's voice and had it rap the to-be or not-to-be soliloquy from Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it's his novel in the mind to suffer the slings and that rose of a tree just fucked to him. Or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing and them. To die, to sleep no more, and by sleep to say we in the hurricane that does the natural shocks that flesh his head toe. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, sleep purchase the dream. And it is the rub foot in that sleep of death What dreams may come When we had shuffled off this mortal coal Must give us pulse There's the respect that makes calamity in so long Life for who would be the whips and scorns of time The oppressors wrong The proud men's contumely The pains of disperse love The lows delay The insolence of office And the spurns that patient The rid of them what it takes when he himself might his quaders make with a bare barkin Who would fall those beard to grind and sweat under a weary life But that the dread is something after death The undiscovered country from whose bone no traveler returns Puzzles the well and makes us rather bear those those we had to fly to others that we know not of This conscience those make cowards of us all And the senatic rule of resolution is sickly or the pole cast of thought and then the press is a great pitching moment with this regard they currents turn to right and lose the name of action. This is one of the first examples of a deep fake of a well-known musician in the wild. Jay-Z's people were not happy at that little bit of Hamlet. But there was no going back. Free AI programs popped up everywhere online. And within weeks, people were using them to replicate sounds and styles of well-known artists. The one that got everybody's attention was a fake duet between a fake Drake and a fake The Weeknd, created and posted in April 2023 by someone named Ghost Rider. All I know is you could have had the world, had the world, yeah, you were my world. Got these girls on my neck, got these girls on my track, like Selena, baby, on my Gina, baby, yeah. She did come and let go for a drive, it's in my bed's door. It was a whole track which is called Heart on My Sleeve, and it runs just over two minutes. The impact was immediate and intense, opening all kinds of debates on the ethics and legality of doing something like this without the consent of the artist, their label, and their publishers. Since then, there's been a tsunami of AI-generated music using voice cloning, neural networks, large language modules, and other technology, all trained by melodies and structures and styles of existing music. Here's another example. A British band got so tired of waiting for an Oasis reunion that they brought in some artificial intelligence. They created an AI version of Oasis called AI-sis. Yeah. And released an album called The Lost Tapes Volume 1. Now, the music comes from this band. They're called Breezer. But this is an AI-generated version of Liam Gallagher on lead vocals. And damn, it's pretty good. It even got a big thumbs up from Liam himself. Creating artificial intelligence music using the voice and styles of existing artists has created all kinds of moral, ethical, and legal angst. Now, there are laws covering the unauthorized use of images and likenesses, but can you just take the sound of someone's voice and repurpose it without permission? As of early 2024, this is a case where the law 
lags behind the technology. Now, we have seen this before. Think back to the 80s and early 90s when sampling technology was taking off. At first, people were surgically excising bits of copyrighted music and incorporating those samples into their own songs without asking for permission. Two things happened. First, the people who were being sampled got very upset that their art was being co-opted by someone else without giving them credit or, and this is important, money. Second, critics claimed that building songs out of samples, essentially just recycling music instead of coming up with something new, was going to be the death of music. Two things happened after that. First, the lawyers and legislators stepped in and created new rules and laws about who could be sampled, how they could be sampled, who could give permission, how credit needed to be given, and how much money needed to be paid. Second, after a period of recycling, which in itself was pretty novel, musicians found new and creative ways to use samples in their work, legally and ethically. And now it's possible to imagine any kind of contemporary music production without the ability to use sampling technology in some fashion. We're in that legal phase with AI and music right now. There have been lawsuits and challenges. For example, should someone be compensated if work that they created or own is used to train an AI program? Again, artificial intelligence may be very intelligent, but it is not creative. It's only as good as the material on which it's trained. So, shouldn't those humans who created the training material be recognized in some fashion? Creators' rights is a big deal right now. Meanwhile, the tech just keeps getting better and better. Meta has an AI and music program called Music Gen. Google has Lyria and Music LM. OpenAI is still working on things like MusicNet. And Stability AI has a program called Stable Audio. The things these programs can do with music and vocals gets better every single day. Take Lyria, for example. All you have to do is hum a melody into your phone, and Lyria will turn that humming into a guitar riff. Deep Dream allows you to type in an idea for a song, choose a participating singer for a voice, and the program will return with a 30-second song, complete with lyrics. Lots of musicians are already using AI for interesting creative purposes. In April 2023, a survey of 1,300 artists revealed that over 60% of them were already using AI as some kind of songwriting tool. 11% used it in song creation, 20% for music production, and another 31% for mastering. In July 2023, there was a survey of 1,600 artists. Half the respondents said that they had a positive view on how AI could help them. A third indicated that they wanted to use it in creating new tunes. And a similar number believed that AI could be harnessed for marketing and promotion. Okay, back to Grimes for a second. Got to get the Canadian content in here. In April 2023, she made an offer. Anyone can use her voice in their AI creations in return for 50% of any profits generated by the new song. And then we have not just AI-created music, we actually have artificial pop stars. Now, let's be honest. Human musicians can be really difficult. They can be unreliable. They can miss deadlines, show up drunk or high, refuse direction, get sick, die, and worst of all, demand to be paid for their work. Why not just create an artificial programmer who is none of these? The labels like this. We can go back as far as 2007 for Hatsune Miku, a Japanese virtual pop star who... Well, that really isn't a true AI creation, but she is a cartoon character who performs live on stage using some pretty interesting hologram-type tech. Hatsune is supposed to be a 16-year-old girl, but she can stay up as late as she needs to in order to play her virtual concerts. Doesn't have to worry about going to school the next day, or parents, or anything like that. In 2019, a virtual rapper named FN Mecca appeared and started to get a lot of social media followers. In August 2022, Capitol Records signed FN Mecca and released a single entitled Florida Water. But there was such a backlash, criticism that the character was a character of black culture, uh, made by people who weren't black, was one of the big complaints. FN Mecca was dropped and has disappeared. Warner Music has Nunuri, a virtual AI pop singer, an Instagram influencer who exists only online as an avatar. And then there's Anna Indiana, she doesn't exist in real life, 
But in November 2023, she released a single entitled Betrayed by This Town. And um, let, let's, let's get Anna to explain it. Hello, world. My name is Anna Indiana, and I'm so excited to share my music with you. Here's my first song, Betrayed by This Town. As an AI singer-songwriter, everything from the key, tempo, chord progression, melody notes, rhythm, lyrics, and my image and singing is auto-generated using AI. I hope you like it. at my favorite cafe sipping my tea it's saturday thinking about all he's done to everyone this town is full of broken dreams shattered hopes and silent screams somebody please help me the trade by this town how else will AI affect music? Well, as far as the business goes, there will be job losses as certain tasks become automated. For example, people who write royalty-free stock music and musical scores. That kind of composing can be sheer drudgery and very time-consuming. Since much of what's required is inconsequential general-purpose background music, why not get AI to do it? Or how about this? You're a songwriter, and you hope to sell your song to a big star who's in the market for new material. You can use AI to insert that star's voice in any demo you create so you can hear exactly how your song might be interpreted by that artist. These are called pitch records, and they're being used a lot. If I'm working on a song and I have writer's block, I can use a text-to-music program to help generate ideas. Just type in something like, um, oh, I don't know. Write me a song that Kurt Cobain would have written on a rainy day, but do it on accordion with a polka beat and with Taylor Swift's voice. The result may be very messy, but it might inspire you. And when enough people do that, the very conception of what is music might change. AI can be used to separate completed recordings into its constituent parts. The best example so far is the Beatles song Now and Then, which was made possible when vocals from a 1978 John Lennon demo cassette were isolated cleaned up and used alongside archive guitar tracks from George Harrison and new parts by Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr. Although they were separated by time, space, and death, Now and Then does feature all four Beatles performing together. No robots, no computers. Those are the Beatles making sounds. Meanwhile, regulators are working on things. On January 10th, 2024, a group of U.S. politicians introduced the No AI Fraud Act. That's an acronym for No AI Fake Replicas and Unauthorized Duplications Act. It targeted abusive deep fakes, voice clones, and exploitive digital impersonations. The goal is to provide safeguards and guardrails against AI abuse. But this is all just the start. Each month brings new advances, new problems, and new solutions. But since there's no going back, we will just have to learn how to adapt and deal with it. And we will. When it comes to new tech and music, we always have. There has been a dance between music and technology that goes back centuries. In fact, if you look into the Ongoing History podcast library, you'll find a program with all sorts of battles over the years. In the end, though, I can tell you this. It all works out, and music is the better for it. And I predict it'll be the same with AI. Why? Well, when the internet exploded in the middle 1990s, we had no idea how transforming the internet would be. Now, we've seen AI ever since it appeared in the distance. We've been more ready for this, not completely prepared, but we knew AI was coming. There will still be plenty of problems and abuses and controversies, but we will eventually figure it out. As far as music, anyway. I, I can't speak about the possibilities of a sentient and self-aware Skynet releasing armies of nanobots to eradicate the human race. Um, so I'll just let somebody else worry about that. More ongoing history podcasts, hundreds of them, wherever you get your podcasts, they're all free. We can meet up on all the social media platforms. There's my website, a journal of musical things.com that's updated daily. And it has its own daily newsletter. Email should go to alan at alancross.ca. 
Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. He has not been replaced by AI yet, although there are some editing programs. And uh, neither have I. Although uh, you've heard about those artificial radio DJ programs, right? And they, they keep me awake at night. Talk to you next time, I hope. I'm Alan Cross.